It's a special edition of Madden Benz Unfiltered. Tim Benz, along with Guy Junker, Trib Live Radio alum, back with us, filling in for Mark Madden as he did last year. Guy, great to see you again. Should mention we're brought to us by Rush to Crush Cancer. More than a bike ride, it's a mission. Don't forget to sign up for the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride in May. I'll have details coming up at the end of our live feed. You can always comment as well. We'll get some comments as the show rolls along. Guy, great to see you again. Thanks for pinch hitting as Mark is off in England watching soccer. Something I know you have a little bit of experience with as a fan yourself, right? Yeah, I was telling you that I did an exchange program at the University of Manchester my senior year of college. And I went to a Manchester City, Manchester United derby game. And uh, these English guys that took me, I was, you know, it was an atmosphere. I didn't, I didn't really know a whole lot about soccer. And I kind of naively was sitting there. There was a moat around the, the pitch. And I said, why is there a moat around the field? And the guy goes, so no one climbs the fence and kills the referee. And I laughed and he goes, no, it's so nobody climbs the fence and kills the referee. <laughs> so that was my introduction to, to British football. <laughs> you needed crocodiles and knights and dragons to guard it as well, I bet, for Manchester United and Man City, right? City was better then. In fact, the, the guy, one of the guys that was sort of my mentor was in charge of the city uh, game program when you went in the stadium. And he actually got me to write a column for the, each game. Uh, he called it, uh, I have a few of them laying around somewhere, Soccer the Stars and Stripes way or something, an American journalist view of our game. <laughs> so, so that was kind of a, that was a big opportunity for a college kid, you know. So you're still doing PA for the Pirates. I know you're enjoying retirement, but one of your side gigs that you're using to keep yourself busy is doing PA for the Pirates. And they're off to a great start. 4-0, and they sweep the Marlins to start the year. Uh, they haven't started 5-0 since the 1983 season, which they went 84-78. Uh, and 78. What have you seen so far from then that's cause for optimism that might continue all the way up until Friday for opening day and then beyond? Well, I, I, you know, I thought from the very beginning as this team was put together, Tim, that their bullpen was going to be great. But then, you know, Majinski's not healthy. Holderman's not healthy. Uh, Dowry Moretta has Tommy John surgery. Bednar was a little iffy for a while, and I started getting concerned about that. I think we all know that starting pitching is their big question mark. Their bullpen was was lights out this weekend. But to me, the good news is when they give up two runs in 20 innings, the bad news is they had to pitch 20 innings. They can't sustain that, even with a 13-man staff. I mean, uh, I think some of their, their bullpen issues last year was overuse early in the season. They definitely have more power than they've had in a while, I think. You know, O'Neill Cruz is just coming back himself with that. Uh, and and uh, what I really liked is the two extra inning games, the ability to come back. I mean, that that start yesterday, you give up last year, if they gave up a grand slam in the first inning, you know, you, you could have turned on a movie. They weren't coming back from four or five nothing down. And and between that and the five to two deficit they faced in the opener, it's pretty encouraging, I think. I feel like the lineup – aspect in the bullpen that you talked about is sustainable enough to get them into the 80 82 3 4 win range something like that I mean I had him at 81 and 81 you know even Ben Charrington acknowledged at the end of last year going from 60 something to 70 something teams can do that I mean it's hard to lose 100 games it's really hard to do it two years in a row which they did so there was a course correction there that just kind of had to take place anticipating another 14 win jump like they had last year to get to 90. I think that's pie in the sky, but I do think what we're seeing so far elements of what they've done to get the first four wins against Miami. Some of that's sustainable. Like the big thing to me for, for all the analysis of where the pirates might be better, where they might not be as good. If Reynolds and Hayes can elevate themselves from eh, decent last year, to where their number should be for what they're paid by pirate standards, that to me, I think might be the biggest variable. Yeah, I mean, we're looking a lot, some young guys, even a cruise still, you know, that that arm throwing balls away, make some bad base running decisions. Those are two guys in the primes of their career, Tim, making mega money. And if you look last year, I know they had a 10 game losing streak. I think they had an eight game losing streak. And a lot of that was when Reynolds and Hayes was hurt, Reynolds wasn't really performing. You look at how Hayes hit at the end of the year. They finished 35 and 32. Reynolds got off to the fast start at the beginning of the year. They started 20 and 8. 
I mean, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but as those two guys went last year, so went the team. So I think you're 100% right. You have to realize, you know, Andrew McCutcheon is what he is, and it's face of the franchise, whatever, and a nice story, but I don't think he's he's not going to carry the team anymore. And it's too much of an expectation for these young guys to do it. So I think those guys are key. And the starting pitching, if, if, there, if there was any day that Pirate fans should have been excited, it was Saturday. What Jared Jones did, as cool as a cucumber in his debut, while Skeens was perfect in Indianapolis. If there's anything that gives you hope for a, for, a, for a farm system that is loaded with pitching. I mean, I'm not overly thrilled with, with the starting rotation they have right. right now, but I think it could change drastically, certainly by the middle of the year. You know, I really liked him, too. I, I, I like the, the, you know, Bailey Falter is the one guy that I, I wasn't quite sure why he was in the rotation. But I love the fact that they have three lefties in, out of the starting five. There's There are eight uh, bullpen guys, four lefties, four righties. It's a nice mix. And there were so many times in recent years where you can get on their pitching staff, every guy was right-handed in a ballpark that screams for left-handed pitching. So I like that balance a lot better than I have in recent years, too. If you look at the start last year when they were 29 in April, so of course I understand why people might view their hot start with a John Desai. We've seen this before as recently as last year. But – the starting pitching aspect last year was just, it was flukishly good for the second half of April. I think if you looked at, I think it was 10 of 11 games. I was looking at the numbers this morning, 10 of 11 games where they gave up three runs or less. Uh, they had one eight to seven loss to the Dodgers, but in that swath between like the 15th and the 30th of April, the pitching was just fantastic. And it was disproportionately good from what you could expect. If Jones, who's a high profile guy in their system, lives up to his pedigree and Skeens comes up soon, then that corrects where the fault is, I think, in the starting pitching. And even if there is a waiver, a correcting to the norm for the bullpen and for the lineup, maybe the solve for that is the fact that the, the starting pitching can get better with those additions. Yeah, and I, I think that's something you can look at. And I, I also, you mentioned that start last year. I think you talked about the 14-game improvement in the start last year. I think if they would have balanced out better, not had such a miserable summer, yeah. and been, been better all year long just consistently, people would have appreciated it more. But everybody got all excited at the end of April last year. Then they thoroughly disappointed them. By the time they started playing good ball again, nobody cared. It was football season. If they could have spread that out. And, and this year – you know, I, I said at the end of last year, people are not going to improve by 14 games. If they can improve by eight games this year over last year, they'd probably be a wild card team. And in this division, if they improve by eight games, they could contend for the division title. I don't see anybody running away with this thing. Yeah, 84 but, wins got you a wild card last year. Right. And um, to your point about spreading it out, they were 20 and nine through March and April. They played one game in March, and then they played the rest of 29 through the first month plus. And then they won 27 games total over the next three months. Right. So, like that's where it qu completely came back and they went in the other direction. They weren't bad the last two months, honestly, but you're right. I think if it would have felt more real, the improvement would have felt more real if it wasn't so dramatically all about one month where, by the way, they just handled the rules changes, the base running, um, the, the pitch clock, they handled that so much better than a lot of teams did to start the year. I mean, they were so young. There were so many guys that were just kind of picked up off the trash heap and thrown together in that lineup last year. They had no room to bitch and gripe like other teams did about the rules changes. So I think, I think other, other that teams caught up to them as the year went yes, on. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It took a month for everybody else to get caught up is basically right. what it comes yeah, down that's to. A, that's a great point. I remember thinking that watching it, but I'd kind of forgot that aspect. Yeah. All right, so that's the Pirates start. Want to hear from you Pirates fans. Guy and I will be with you up until about 10 o'clock. We'll take some comments, some coming in already, although I see a lot of them are about the Penguins, so let's get to that. Guy, because that's the other direction. Now, look, I'm willing to fool myself into thinking that the Pirates might be something for a month or two because I've been fooling myself that the Penguins are going to figure it out for six. So I can keep doing this as long as we need to. I can talk myself into anything. I just saw Duquesne win an NCAA tournament game in person. I, I can talk myself into anything now. But the Penguins, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and they just can't. They never get any traction going. I mean, even as recently as this week, people were looking at the standings saying, hey, there's only a five-point differential. There's only a five-point differential to get in that last wild card. Of course, there were like five teams between them and the wild card. But they have an, an utter inability to sustain a winning streak. 
And the reason for that is they're no good with the lead. They blew a two-goal lead to Columbus. Ugh. I mean, if you can't get back-to-back against Columbus to maintain a winning streak, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. I it, the I gave up when they lost the game in Calgary when they, they had a 3-1 lead with 10 minutes to go and were going on the power play and lost that game. And then, you know, the Edmonton game, That that's when I thought there's no way. I still had hope to that point. And I even found myself on Saturday, Tim, when they were up 3-1 in Columbus, all right, it's back-to-back against Columbus. They stink. But I'm, I'm sitting there thinking if they wouldn't have blown that 4 nothing lead last week, they really – and my mind starts drifting into that whole yes. state, which is ridiculous. Uh, and I, I am more disappointed in them because I really think they've underachieved. I think they are a lot better than what their record is. Are they a Stanley Cup contender? No. But I certainly think with the talent they have, they should be. If their power play was just average, they'd be in a playoff position right now. I can't believe – they, th- they can throw some of those guys out there, and I know some of them are past their prime, not Sid, but when you can throw the kind of talent you can out there at three-on-three three in overtime or at five-on-four in regulation, and you still can't – not only can't you score, but you're giving up shorthanded goals left and right. If you didn't fix anything else all the whole rest of the year, that would have been enough to get them in. But I have no – and, and you're right about – it's the teams they got to jump over. Okay, if they stay within five – but then when you've got – uh, the Devils and the Islanders and Detroit, you all have to jump over to get to that wild card spot. That's not happened in the last week. No, uh, your point about them underachieving, I think with the addition of Carlson, that makes it look all the worse. And they've got to figure out at some point what they're doing with Jari long term. I mean, that sounds funny to say after they just signed him long term, but now they're going to Nedeljkovic. Like Nedeljkovic, I thought was good for them early. He's been better for them lately than Jari has, but. There was a lull in the middle for him. He's never going to be more than a backup. And I'm wondering what it is that went wrong with Jari here in the last third of the season that makes them feel like this is a two-man net again, uh, as we saw at the start of the year. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure of that. But I think that I, I do think that so much of the issue here is, is related to, you know, Hextall's mismanagement of this team. You, you look at uh, Jared McCann leading Seattle and piling up those points. Uh, not that, you know, they worried about not being able to protect him so that he could keep his pal Jeff Carter under contract, which no one, nobody was going to take him anyway. Uh, I think Kyle Dubas is faced with an absolutely impossible task. I don't think you can make this team good while holding on to those high paid core aging veterans. The goaltending situation, I you know the thought has crossed my mind. They kept the Jari's hip problem kind of a uh, a secret for a long time. Could that it started to nag him a little bit? And he still hasn't played terrible. I mean, his numbers, no. his, his wins losses are much worse than his goals against and his save percentage. Um, and Nadalkovich, if you look at his career though, Tim, I think he's been kind of inconsistent up and down. He's looked really good at times in the past, and then wound up back in the minor leagues a little bit. I I don't think I would. If, if they do have an idea of trading Jari, I still think they got to get another pretty high end caliber goalie somehow, because I, if it's Nadelkovic and, and they bring somebody up from the minors, one of the, you know, they, they do have some goaltending talent that I think down the road will help them out. I wouldn't trust that. One thing that has really hurt them lately and prevented them from getting in gear is However good Latang was for the first two thirds of the season, it's gone completely the other direction here lately. Right. Well, and then he had that one. What game was it where he gave up the puck twice and they ended up losing in the final minute of the game? I can't remember who they were playing now. Well, Columbus, he fanned on that puck and gave up the goal going back the other way. Yeah, but there were there was a game where he 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 had two giveaways in the third period, both resulted in goals. And you would think a guy of his stature, probably a hall of famer that you're con- I think his confidence is shot. I thought he had the, uh, you know, some of the pressure was taken off of him with the addition of Carlson. And while it didn't work out with Carlson, I thought he up until early February was having one of the best years of his career. Um, so I'm not sure what is, is this permanent? Is it, is, is he regressed? Is this an age thing? Is this the best we're going to see out of him the rest of the way? I don't know. And I, I also think that Carlson can be better if he's here next year, uh, if he fits in a, a little bit. I'm more disappointed with the Riley Smiths and yeah. the Graves. Well, that's true, too. You know, for as much as we want to heap on Hextall for what he left behind, we also have to remember that Dubas, the moves that he's made so far this season, haven't been good. 
Right. What he's done so far in terms of his additions with the team have just not been good. Right. And I and I'll say this though, when he made them, I liked them. I was pretty impressed with what they had on paper, you know, last October. I thought he did a good job in being able to get Carlson dump. I thought some of the best work he did was dumping crap salaries and and players that you didn't want here anyway, and still putting together a pretty good roster. So I was kind of duped into that too. And some, you know, that, that's that's the hard part about being a general manager. Sometimes you do it. You know, we all thought a Stanley Cup parade plan when they got Jerome McGinley that year, and that turned out to be a total disaster. So you never know how it's going to work out. And I still think some things could. Uh, the, the one thing that I I I, I still love watching Tim, and uh, you know, the, 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 I have no hopes of them making the play. Sidney Crosby is just. Yeah, there. Here's a guy. The other night, the the goalies pulled, and he, they can't. There's four guys, and they can't get the puck off him behind the net. Yeah. And then he finally loses it, and he gets it back. I mean, he's diving at the blue line to keep keep the puck from going out over the blue line. And I, 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 I just love watching the guy play. He's unbelievable. What do you deem to be the more true statement that their biggest problem trying to play the make the way Mike Sullivan wants to play is that they don't have the flat out speed to do it anymore? They don't move the puck as well as they used to. I think it's the speed more than that, and it, well, it's it's both. But I think it's the speed thing, and I think you know in any sport, I think the coach has to adapt to what he has. You can't, you okay? You can't be a, sold on on zone defense in basketball if you don't have the players to play the zone defense. You can't. You can't want to be a, a home run hitting baseball team if you've got a lineup of small ball guys. And I think sometimes, and, and I, I have tremendous respect for Mike Sullivan personally and professionally, uh, but I, I think it has to be considered a coaching change needs to be considered here as solid as he is with the Fenway group and everything. Cause I just don't think that they're they're uh, He has adapted to what he has sitting in front of him on that bench every night. Once again, Guy Junker in for Mark Madden today. Madden Ben's Unfiltered, brought to us by Rush to Crush Cancer. More than a ride, it's a mission. Join us Sunday, May 19th for the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride. Whether you're a cycling enthusiast, just love the mission, or you're a part of a group, we've got a course for you. It's all uh, a case for everybody in Pittsburgh. Everybody knows somebody who's been affected by cancer. So register today. Go to rushtocrushcancer.org. That's rushtocrushcancer.org. And help us in the fight against cancer. Uh, Guy, let's get to the Steelers because I know you're keeping tabs on them as well and all the moves they've made this offseason. I think they've improved in the quarterback room. Uh, I think the potential is there to be better with Russell Wilson. I think there's a major difference between us applauding the contract of Russell Wilson and applauding the quarterback, though. I think there's been some pirate fan mentality that seeped into the Steeler way of thinking here where they've got a good deal for a quarterback. Is he still actually a good quarterback? That's a different question entirely. Well, I mean, they had that string of five wins in a row for Denver last year against some very good teams, Buffalo, Kansas City. I can't remember the, the exact order, but uh, Kenny Pickett had a winning record too. I mean, he won some games. That didn't mean that they, he played pretty in the games that he won. Um, I, I love the way they're operating now, Tim, because, you know, for years you talked about the Steeler way. And I said on DV a couple of weeks ago, if I heard a rumor now that they were thinking about bringing Terry Bradshaw back to play, I'd say, hey, maybe it could happen. You know, you used to be like, they won't do that. They never trade. They don't they don't negotiate contracts midseason. They don't do you know, you don't know what you're going to get out of Omar Khan. I think it's exciting as a fan. They go after uh, he reminds me of a little bit of the way that Jim Rutherford operated with the Penguins. I mean, they didn't uh, know grass yeah, grows on the biggest. Their feet. The biggest difference between how they operate and Rutherford operates is they tell you the opposite of what you're doing, whereas <laughs> Rutherford would just tell you what he's going to do. Hey, yeah. we need another goalie. Hey, yeah. you know what? we need another winger. I, I need some help with a left-handed defenseman. And he'd go out and he'd get a guy. He'd just tell you what he was going to do. He was the most forthright person I think I've dealt with in 45 years of media here. You, you're right. You, you knew you were going to get something out of him. Whereas the Steelers, they say we have the utmost faith in Kenny Pickett. And then he's an eagle three weeks later. <laughs> right. And, but I think he some of that he undid himself. I'm not, you know, I remember when I when uh, Con made that remark when I read it. I thought, okay, well, that's where, that direction they're going. But then... Somehow I saw the clip somewhere on the internet when I was looking and I thought, boy, he didn't sound very confident making that statement. It looked different when I read it than when I heard him actually speak it. But I think that um, in terms of Russell Wilson's ability, Tim, for, for, for them to be able to get those two quarterbacks over what they had last year and for what they had to spend for it, even, even in getting fields in here, 
I think the price for him dropped drastically. Kirk Cousins and other people all started moving around and signing. All of a sudden, he became, you know, I thought it was going to take a second or third round pick maybe to get the guy. So I think they did a good job in getting bang for their buck. If you look at what Wilson did, he won some games. It, it, it's strange to me that he, he became so unwanted in Denver that they're willing to spend $38, 39000000 million for him not to play for him. But I think there's a lot of lot in there of what we've grown to dislike, the, the not wanting to throw the ball down the field, lots of short passes. Middle of the field, avoiding middle of the field. Like avoiding the middle of the, the field. And, but, but, but I also, I, I'm, all, I'm all, just to have the fresh air of two new guys and more importantly than anything else to me is a new offensive coordinator with a pretty good duo of running backs. I think it can work. I still, I think their defense underperformed last year. I think it can, I think it can be better even with some of their stars aging and uh, I'm still excited about what they are, but I think you're right. I think, I think people are a little bit overexcited at getting a Super Bowl quarterback on one end and a guy with, I still think, a lot of high-end potential, a young guy the other way. But there's no doubt the room is better than it was. Let's get some comments. Ron says, Tim, guy, love the show. Uh, he also adds, Sully has to practice three-on-three -three overtime next year. Too many points given away. Yeah, those are – that's definitely been an issue. Um You'd figure with the talent that they have, and you alluded to this earlier, guy, that they should be better on open ice like that, and it's just never coalesced. Well, it, I get ner the second Malkin steps on the ice in those situations, I'm I, I'm ready to give up the game. I I he, I think his play is see, you know, we talked about Latang. Latang was good till February. Malkin was good to Halloween. He had a good first month, and he he looks to me like a guy that's ready to retire. I think he, and in fact, not only has he not helped them, I think he's hurt them more than he's helped them. But but you know, that that's a situation, you know, a couple of years ago, they got the three on three and you'd have, you know, Crosby, Malk and Latang out there. It was it was like a circus. It was fun to watch. Now I just keep seeing them taking the puck back out over the blue line and regrouping. They never get anything, uh, get any shots on goal. Eric says typical pens up three one in the third and blow it. I'm worried Sullivan and the big four will be back and much of the same will occur next season. You know, Madden's made the point here, Guy. I'll bounce this opinion off you and tell me what you think because I, I do think he makes a good point here. The way for Dubas to get out from underneath this is go to the core four and say, look, we're rebuilding. You can be here for it or not. I mean, if part of the reason why you wanted to stay is you thought that as long as you were part of a roster in perpetuity it was going to be a contender, clearly that's not the case. So we're going younger. We're going to start to build for the future as much as we can. And if you want to be here for this, great. If not, then wave your no movement clauses and we'll get you somewhere else. I think that might be the fastest way out from under what Ron Hextall has wrought here. I agree. I, I love the four, Tim. I do think, and he has said this, and, and Sid's pretty honest, that he wants to play his whole career as a Penguin. I, I think Sid will ride it out. I think the fact that he's won three cups, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Is that enough? No. I mean, you, you always want to win more. But I don't think it's the situation where we've seen people in the past who's never who've never won a Stanley Cup traded to it so that they could get one before they retire. Uh, now, a guy like Latang, I mean, he, he may want to go up and play, say, for the Canadians or somewhere up in Canada. You know, um, and I, I don't know. Rick, um, I don't know Carlson well enough. I, you know, I talked to him a few times when he played for Ottawa. And I haven't been an, a working member of the media this year with the Penguins getting him. So I, I don't I can't figure him out. In fact, that's one of the it's, it's sometimes it's kind of nice to watch stuff as a fan and not. But but I do miss being at practices and hearing the, the poop every day. And, you know, because you can make it make your own decisions when you're watching practice and listening to what guys are saying and reading between the lines. And now I'm just I'm, I'm just out here uh, on the fringe. But, uh, but but I would think of that group, there's a possibility there's other guys. You know, I've always heard that you know, Malkin wanted to go to Tampa and his wife likes Tampa and they're still a pretty good team. Would he accept a trade there? Or um, Florida. Yeah, or or my yeah, or the Panthers. And then there's a team that, you know, certainly could win the cup. But I, I still would be surprised. The only one I'd be disappointed in if he went, went would be Sid. I think he should be. Well, especially because he's the one that wanted this, you know. Yes. Like, he's, yeah. he's the one that wanted all these guys to stay. So if you were to up and go and say, I want to go to a contender, then you're really leaving the Penguins with their hands tied. Right. Richard says Dubas has his hands tied because it's all but guaranteed Sullivan of the core four will return, meaning other than a few names around the core, it's the same old next season. Yeah, but you know what? If he aligns himself as publicly as he consist consistently is doing with Sullivan, I can't blame FSG 
for the Sullivan thing if Dubas is really meaning what he's saying about how important he thinks Sullivan is. You know, he keeps falling back to this line of once you get rid of Mike Sullivan, you need Mike Sullivan. I'd argue this isn't the Mike Sullivan that we've all come to know going back to 2018. They've been looking for that Mike Sullivan for five years, I think, now. And part of that guy is a willingness to allow young players to play an extended stretch of minutes per game and not nailing their butt to the bench whenever they make a mistake and putting some old guy in there. You know, like Tim, was- Ryan, Ryan Recker sent me a uh, an interview I had done with Jake Gensel at Penguin Prospect Camp the year before they brought him up. And I had asked him the question. I said, hey, last year they brought some guys up that had never played in the NHL from, pro- in pro- you know, that I talked to in Prospect Camp and they wind up getting their name on the Stanley Cup. Do you mm-hmm. have any, do you have any, you know, does that, that thought enter your head at all? And you know, and he responded and said, of course, you know, it would be a great, oh, of course, he came up and became a very important part of the second cup that, that year. And you're, you're right. Those guys play. I mean, you can go back to the, the first two cups they won in the early 90s and bringing up the jock calendars and the, the Mike Needhams and letting them play when people were hurt. And it, it seems like, and, and I also think that not only in not letting the young guys play, are they not developing or giving you a chance, but I think a large part of some of the, the problems with the Carlsons, the Latangs, and the Malkins is over ice time at this stage of their career. They're out there. When they're out there a minute 40 on the first power play, I, I, I wanna, that's why you're getting odd man breaks and giving up shorthanded goals. These guys can't skate for a minute 40 on, on the power play. Leave them out there a minute and get them off. 45 seconds. So and I, I agree with that. And, and I, I never hear him criticize them at all either. It's yeah. almost like, and, and maybe they look, maybe they've been around long enough that the, publicly they shouldn't be criticized. But I think you, you got to crack the whip a little bit once in a while when they're, you know, there have been times this year where guys have made the most egregious errors, taken the stupidest penalties. And yet they're out there on their next shot. Make a guy sit a period. I don't care who he is if he if he if he makes a mistake that bad. To have some people, have some accountability, have them think about things. And, yeah, I, so and the other thing I would disagree with, with, guy that with has- our, our emailer is I think you can improve the bottom six if you get some young, hungry people that that can complement them and not have guys that are just sort of satisfied. You know, all you're even saying that Riley Smith didn't really want to be here. I've never talked to him. I can't say that but get some people that do want to be here. And I think you can make a difference in the bottom end of this team. Uh, yeah. I think like Drew O'Connor is the only guy that has to show accountability. It feels like, you know, yeah. and, and <laughs> for the most part, he, he has, I mean, uh, to me, that's one of the bright spots moving forward. There's a guy that looks like he's developed. Richard says the main issue with the pens is stubbornness and refusal to adapt to change. They would rather lose doing it their way rather than consider trying to do something different. It's applicable to both coaching and, and the players on the ice. Yeah, and I do think it is a one hand washes the other scenario because they want to play the way that they want to play, and Sullivan lets them do it. Right. So there's, uh, there's, Mark's been saying that for a couple of years now, even when he was on with, with Stan and I regularly, that, you know, that, that they want to play the way they want to play. And especially when you, you know, um, especially this inability to hold leads, I think that's what's frustrating the most, Tim. It's not that they – you know, if they were out there, look, you and I have been covering the Penguins a long time. We've seen teams that regularly lost games five to one and never had a yeah. shot. The, these these third period leads that they have blown, one drive, just batting down the hatches a little bit and stop trying to get the fourth goal, try to present pre- prevent the second goal by the other team. You know, I used to love with Scotty Bowman, even in the, the heyday with Lemieux and all those great offensive players, when Scotty Bowman was coaching this team, they'd score a goal. The next line out there would have Troy Loney, Bob Erie, guys like that out there to calm everything down and make sure they weren't going to go crazy and try to get another one. Now they score. How many times this year have they scored a goal in a minute later? That game in Colorado last week, yep. P.L. Joseph scores that fourth goal, and they can't enjoy the 4 nothing lead for 90 seconds. They have to give one up. Last one from Jeremy. Favorite Easter dish. My mom always brings pickled eggs. Strangely delicious. I can't say that I've ever had a pickled egg. I've seen Uh, them. I've never eaten one. I'm allergic to eggs. I found that out like when I was in college. I love deviled eggs. I didn't realize that they were making me sick, so I don't eat eggs anymore. But deviled eggs, yes. Pickled eggs, I've never had a pickled egg. My mom, my mother would. And she didn't just make them at Easter though. She would pickle eggs with beets in in this big jar. So you'd have like hard boiled eggs with the beets. And I loved eating those too. It's, my mom's been gone a long, long time, so I haven't had those in a long time. But um, I'll go. I'll go. My sister makes these cheesy potatoes, and why it, it's an Easter dish thing for her. 
they're topped with cornflakes, which sounds weird, but it provides a crunch <laughs> over the cheese. I had some yesterday. I'd, I'll go with that. I'll go with basic ham. But yeah, the uh, cheesy <laughs> potatoes were part of our Easter yesterday, too. Guy, before we go, anybody touch UConn in the final four or no? Uh, what sure they did to Illinois like to me was so impressive. I saw Illinois and I thought they were really good against Duke. And I said, wow, this team might give Duke, might give UConn a run. They didn't give him a run at all. Was that a 30 to nothing run that they we had? We had a house full of people, Tim, and my son in law is a big basketball fan, big better. He, so I walked into the room. He's watching the game. It's 23 23. And I said, wow, someone's finally hanging with these guys a little bit. I went back in the other room. I was serving some coffee and stuff. We had a, I walked in the other room. It's 53 to 23. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell happened here? So, yeah, they, they look, uh, they lost the three games that they lost are all to unbelievable, you know, good teams. Kansas beat them. I think Kansas, Gonzaga, and Creighton, I think, are the three teams that beat them. NC State is a heck of a story, though. I mean, boy, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredible how they've come on. And once you get on a roll like that and start believing, who knows? But if you gave me UConn or, or the other three, I would take UConn. Guys, great doing this again with you. It reminds me of the old days doing the Trib Live radio show, and I look forward to seeing you a bunch over at the park this season, all right? Yeah, thanks for dusting me off a little bit, Tim. <laughs> we, got a, we got an opening day rehearsal tomorrow. I hope the weather improves a little bit. All right, we'll see you soon. Guy Junker filling in for Mark Mad today here on Madden Benz Unfiltered, brought to us by Rush to Crush Cancer. More than a ride, it's a mission. Join us May 19th for the Rush to Crush Cancer bike ride. To register, go to rushtocrushcancer.org. And help us in the fight against cancer. Join the ride.